Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the GLOBE webinar series on the future of global governance. I am Carrie Otterburn of the Lubin Center for Global Governance Studies, and I will be moderating today's discussion. Today, we are joined by Professor Shirzad Shadakojev to discuss his book, Industrial Policy and the World Trade Organization, Between Legal Constraints and Flexibilities, published in 2018 by Cambridge University Press. Shirzad is professor at the Korea Development Institute KDI School of Public Policy and Management. He is also a visiting professor at the Institute Barcelona Estudis Internacionales. Previously, he worked for Korea Institute for International Economic Policy as a research fellow. He has done extensive academic and policy research in international economic law and has also authored the book Retaliation in the WTO Dispute Settlement System. Also joining us today as discussant is Dr. Dylan Keretz. Dylan is an associate at Meyer Brown's Public Policy, Regulatory and Political Law and International Trade Practices in Brussels. He advises clients on a wide range of issues in the field of international trade, and he represents clients in WTO dispute settlement proceedings and in proceedings before the Court of Justice of the European Union. Dylan is also an affiliated senior researcher at KU Leuven and an associate fellow of the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation by Shirzad of about 25 minutes. Then Dylan will start off the discussion by offering his reflections and asking a few questions. And Shirzad will have an opportunity to respond. Then we'll turn to questions from the audience. Feel free to send questions to me throughout the webinar by using the webinar chat box function on the side of the webinar window. I will collect your questions to share with the speakers following the presentations. Before we begin, just a few words about the GLOBE project. Funded by the European Commission's Horizon 2020 program, GLOBE seeks to understand the constraints and opportunities for the European Union in promoting its interests and values through global governance, with specific attention to four key areas, trade and development, security and migration, climate change, and global finance. The three and a half year project aims to identify the major roadblocks to effective and coherent global governance by multiple stakeholders in a multipolar world, as well as to look ahead to 2030 and 2050 to equip policymakers with the tools they will need to deal with future challenges. On behalf of the GLOBE project, I would like to thank both Shirzad and Dylan for joining us today. And now it is my great pleasure to give the floor to Shirzad. You have the floor. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Harry, for this nice introduction. And thank you very much, Dylan, for your time um, to participate in this wonderful uh, webinar as a uh, discussant and thank you very, very much for the audience to join us today. Uh, today I'm going to briefly explain um, the key concepts and arguments that I uh, put into my recently published book which is entitled Industrial Policy and the World Trade Organization Between Legal Constraints and Flexibilities. Since uh, the scope of the book is very broad and there are so many issues I try to um, squeeze down uh, many uh, important issues and highlight those uh, matters and issues that are especially uh, of importance to today's uh, policy making in industrial and uh, trade policies. So first let me briefly uh, highlight why this book is actually uh, worth reading. Uh, to me uh, there are at least uh, uh, four points. So first this book uh, considers both economic and legal aspects of industrial policy and uses and I tried to use a, a, as easy language as possible to uh, put many uh, difficult le uh, legal um, cases and terminology uh, in, in such a way so as to be accessible to general readers. And also this book explores various issues from real practice and also looks at how industrial policy has actually worked at domestic level in the example of some countries and how uh, these industrial policies have been dealt with in international forms. So it already received some uh, positive feedbacks, uh, one feedback from Professor Julia Sheen and the other is by one book reviewer uh, in foreign affairs. And also there is one um, short YouTube clip about this book, which was prepared by uh, Mr. Philip Taylor, uh, NBA review. So uh, actually why? industrial policy. So um, first of all, I would like to mention that uh, since the 18th century, there have been four industrial revolutions. The first one um, mechanized the manufacturing with water and steam power, uh, followed by the next um, 
technological breakthrough through the use of electricity uh, of mass production. And most recently, uh, in 1960s, uh, we uh, are experiencing a certain digital revolution by uh, incorporation many IT technologies into manufacturing uh, and other uh, services. And currently, uh, we're undergoing the digital revolution, where we see uh, the kind of fusion between uh, digital, uh, sorry, uh, digital, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, which uh, is a kind of combination of digital revolution uh, and the fusion of other technologies mm -hmm. cutting across the physical, digital, and biological domains. Uh, I guess the renewed interest in industrial policy um, has gained uh, since um, the uh, recent global financial crisis uh, of 2008 and 9, and uh, resulting Great Recession, where um, you know the literature and many policymakers and many researchers have tried to find the way of right uh, government interventions, uh, so as to um, keep many economists. Uh, from completely uh, from complete uh, collapse uh, amidst this global financial crisis. Uh, so this is uh, about the industrial policy part, and uh, to shortly introduce the multilateral trading system, we can say that um, uh, this system uh, has increased its presence in the global um, policy making domain by uh, covering. Um, currently 98% of global uh, trade, whereas initially it covered only 70%. Uh, and I guess the current trends in uh, the, on the trade fronts also uh, signify the importance of uh, the topic of this book. So first of all, recently there have been increasing calls for the WT reform, which is currently experiencing a certain crisis um, on many uh, issues. Then uh, we're also seeing the trend of using uh, by many uh, countries, including uh, great powers, uh, certain policies of protecting their uh, producers, protecting their industrial sectors, and also um, using uh, certain protectionist measures as a response uh, to the existing ones, which you know triggers a series of uh, trade wars between the United States, uh, China, and uh, many other countries. Also recently, uh, the Brexit talks um, bring uh, you know the WTO issues into the spotlight because after the uh, the UK's breakdown from uh, the EU, it is very important to see how the WTO system would impact on the future of you know relations between the EU and uh, UK, and especially on uh, the policy making in UK itself. So here's a um, brief table of contents. As you can see, the book consists of two uh, big parts, one dealing with general issues, uh, such as uh, industrial policy, the conceptual framework of industrial policy under the global trade regime, followed by um, two basic tools of you know, intervening into uh, industries. One is uh, being uh, protecting domestic industry. The, the second is uh, by promoting domestic industries. Uh, so this part one uh, intends to provide general conceptual framework for uh, more specific issues covered by uh, part two of this book, which is uh, about uh, zoning of industrial policy through the use of special economic zones, uh, which is about local content requirements, the greening of industrial policy, and uh, industrial policy in the age of uh, creative economy. So the purpose, the general, the overall purpose of this book is to examine uh, the extent to which industrial policy is regulated by the WTO's legal framework, with particular reference to the existing constraints, um, legal constraints and flexibilities that are available to policymakers uh, on the industrial issues. So, um, so first of all, um, I was kind of uh, puzzled with the definition of industrial policy because I found more than 20 Kind of definitions um, of industrial policy that have been provided since 1970s, if I'm not mistaken, and I ended up with uh, the most recent, to my knowledge, uh, concept of industrial policy provided by uh, uh, Warwick in one OECD paper, 
uh, to whom industry policy is any type of the intervention of government policy that attempts to improve the business environment or to alter the structure of economic activity uh, crossing across many sectors, technologies or tasks and so on and so forth. So a more specific uh, definition is provided here. So um, if we just you know, summarize what he is uh, saying is that industrial policy is something that, mm, you know, that covers selective and horizontal policies uh, that are not necessarily confined to manufacturing industries only, but also could cover, let's say, services and other uh, service-related sectors, and um, whose purpose is not only uh, confined to economic development or economic issues, but also may uh, stretch to other non-economic sectors such as environment, security, and others. So this table, in this table, you can see how broad industrial policy is. So horizontal policies, selective policies, as presented by you know, product markets, labor and skills, capital markets, land, technology, systems, and institutions. And in many uh, ways, some of these, or many of these, actually, uh, parts of both horizontal and uh, selective uh, policies, they, uh, they directly or indirectly impact on trade and here is why uh, the knowledge of why uh, the knowledge of the WTO system uh, is important for uh, doing a proper industrial policy uh, so i will just briefly mention that economic literature on industrial policy goes back uh, to the early studies of by adam smith david ricardo alexander hamilton Frederick list and others um, with some of them you know advocating the free market uh, idea, the others advocating certain um, policy space for government interventions were relevant. And most recent uh, studies, they uh, go back to the end of the World War, uh, of the Second World War, where, um, you know, a number of studies uh, try to justify um, government interventions uh, for the purpose of industrial policies. So generally, we can here identify two approaches. One is the laissez-faire approach, which generally says that there is no space for, for government to intervene. Basically, it is the market that should define for itself um, um, what the price should be, um, what agents should you know keep alive, uh, and so on and so forth. And the um, and the traditional traditional approach, uh, which is about you know allowing the government to intervene and here uh, in the case of intervention we can see the functional industrial policy which is effect uh, which affects uh, uh, all of the whole economy and we can see the selective industrial policy which is about uh, the targeting of particular sectors and also um, the economic liter literature deals with both hard industrial policies, that means the government interventions as such, through tariffs, subsidies, and other uh, trade-related uh, uh, measures. And also there is a concept of soft industrial policy, which uh, basically focuses on um, supporting the kind of collaboration between the government and industries in defining uh, the industrial policies. So overall, uh, there, there seems to be a, the consensus about not whether industrial policy or why industrial policy is needed, but rather on how industrial policy should be uh, pursued. And here we, in addressing this uh, question of how industrial policy should be uh, implemented, we uh, necessarily um, you know, and see the role of uh, the WTO's law, because um, one thing is when industrial policy is implemented in the right way from the economic perspective. And the second thing is when the industrial policy is pursued in the right, right way from the perspective of WTO law, uh, <clears throat> which deals with trade. And in the previous slides, we saw that many areas of industrial policy, uh, they overlap uh, with trade issues. Uh, also in this book, um, I just used the case of East Asia uh, as a kind of uh, case study for industrial policies because uh, this region is very well known for its rapid development uh, in the last 30 or 40 years or so. Except Hong Kong, uh, Korea, Singapore, Chinese Taipei, and Japan, they they were they used extensive industrial policy uh, 
first it was more or less selective, uh, I mean, import substitution policy, then they shifted to export oriented subsidy. So if we just uh, make an overall conclusion about how, what this regime uh, of uh, East Asian, you know, miracle uh, was about is that the countries they, uh, in this region, they basically pursued export oriented, performance based, and internal well coordinated industrial policy. Um, so, what lessons can be drawn from this uh, case is that uh, the targeted industrial policies made only minor contribution in this uh, area, uh, in this region. Uh, but let's say the export push uh, policies pursued by these countries uh, was considered as most successful part of industrial policy in promoting, uh, you know, export oriented industry rather than import substitutive uh, industries uh, was considered as, uh, as a success. And here is the lesson that other countries uh, may uh, learn. And also in the, uh, the governments in this region, they provided incentives and subsidies strictly uh, on a performance-based uh, base, uh, on performance-based approach because Whenever they provided these uh, papers, they always monitored whether um, you know recipient, recipients were doing well or not. And the public-private channel of communication existed in all of these countries and uh, functioned well. But at the same time, uh, we should you know emphasize that the fact that these uh, countries in East Asia uh, were successful in pursuing that industrial policy in this way does not necessarily mean that you know they create one size fit uh, all models for all developing countries because now the realities have changed uh, tremendously. But still, uh, some parts of these policies, let's say the public private channel of communication or even expert push at, uh, at some point, um, can be pursued even under um, the current you know, strict uh, WTO uh, rules. Uh, so, in the case of the multilateral trading system, the point here is that. Uh, any member of this uh, system, currently we have 164 uh, you know, uh, jurisdictions uh, that participate in this system. So once they are in the WTO, then uh, they have their hands tied in respect of you know, implementing their industrial and other uh, policies. And this is derivable from the very provisions of the WTO agreements, which says that each member shall ensure the conformance of its laws and regulations with uh, the agreed agreements under this system and also whenever the disputes arise and the panel or the appellate body issues rulings uh, uh, being approved by the WT membership uh, these rulings become um, you know uh, a binding uh, rules or obligation for the disputing parties to follow and also this system has created de facto uh, precedence uh, practice so essentially, the WTO as a system, as a legal system, can control industrial policies through its rule setting functions, through its judicial uh, functions by uh, settling the disputes, and through its monitoring or uh, political functions of providing sector or topic specific uh, you know, meetings, discussions, and providing general uh, monitoring. So whereas WTO uh, rules are quite strict they still provide some flexibilities for the uh, countries be it horizontal flexibility such as general uh, exceptions security exceptions regional trade exceptions such as uh, exceptions for free trade agreements or customs unions uh, and also uh, it could be member specific exceptions provided uh, to particular members uh, through the process of accession negotiations of newly exceeding countries or through the process of uh, waivers Besides uh, the developing countries as uh, one group uh, is provided special and differential treatment. Um, that, that, that means uh, more flexible uh, treatment uh, under this system compared to the treatment given to developed countries. So in chapter uh, two, um, I consider the basic uh, general uh, trade instruments that governments used for protecting their uh, domestic uh, producers. It means here we are discussing um, 
the restrictions and policy space uh, that the WTO provides for governments in uh, conducting industrial policy from the protective side. So these are basically tariffs, quantitative restrictions, trade remedies, next, uh, taxes and product standards such as technical barriers to trade and uh, sanitary and phytosanitary uh, measures. So chapter three is about basically promotion of domestic industries. So one uh, thing is when the countries, they protect their industries from foreign competition. But the other thing is also that the government decides, they provide sometimes huge incentives to particular sectors or across uh, the board to make their uh, producers uh, competitive on the global market. And here we, we see, um, how the double tier rules, especially on the subsidies, uh, can you know regulate the government behaviors in uh, promoting their industries. So subsidies uh, rules are contained in the uh, agreement, basically on, uh, in Article Six of the GATT and in the agreement on subsidies and countervailing uh, measures agreement. So basically, uh, this agreement says not to provide subsidies for export promotion, export-oriented subsidies, and not to uh, provide import substitutive uh, subsidies, both of which uh, are considered as prohibited ones. Otherwise, or other, you know, selective subsidies, that means subsidies provided to particular industries, enterprises, or regions, they are, uh, they are considered specific and thus um, potentially um, are are, are potential subject to WTO uh, restrictions. So uh, besides these uh, requirements and restrictions, there are certain uh, flexibilities as well. So uh, in the Canada uh, TIT case, the appellate body uh, provided certain interpretation of the existing rules that can be considered uh, by many governments in as a kind of signal of supporting their infant industries. Basically, the Apple body said that the government uh, support for not yet existing market is not necessarily a subsidy. And also, the flexibilities can be derived from the already mentioned special and differential regime that uh, here are available for um, export subsidies. So, I think is as I already uh, mentioned, the import substitution or local content subsidies and export subsidies, they are both uh, prohibited alike, but uh, the availability of flexibilities, they are not provided to these, to, uh, you know, equally prohibited subsidies are not provided in the same way because the uh, export uh, uh, subsidies are still, um, can still benefit from the SMD treatment. So basically this could be a kind of, uh, suggestion that perhaps a WTO's law uh, overall uh, prefers export-oriented industrial policy over uh, import substitution policy and generally the economics uh, in this uh, economic uh, the economic literature um, is also uh, more lenient toward export-oriented industrial policy rather than the import substitution policy. Uh, and in the areas like services uh, the governments have more leeway because um, Currently, the GATS does not um, have strict or specific tailor-made uh, regulations for services subsidies as uh, the SCM agreement. Uh, so I also consider the case of industrial policy in upstream sectors where, you know, where the governments, uh, the energy or uh, resource endowed uh, our countries can explode their uh, natural resources for the economic uh, policy purposes. And here, uh, there are certain, uh, you know, trade instruments such as deal pricing and export restrictions that governments uh, have actually uh, have quite frequently uh, utilized uh, for the purposes of uh, nurturing their own and supporting their own uh, industries. And again, here we can see. Um, a lot of double tier restrictions, but uh, the restrictions like, uh, but in the case of export duties, for example, uh, this is a really member specific approach where, because the WT general does not uh, prohibit export duties as such. And in the case of dual pricing, there are certain rules, but overall the WTS uh, system seems to be uh, quite weak in capturing dual pricing uh, industrial policies. <clears throat> 
So here we can learn that uh, on, uh, to be on a safer footing, the government should avoid localization and export promotion to the extent they can. Uh, and also, uh, what I uh, believe is that each country should, uh, uh, should have its own self-screening mechanism, which necessitates a close collaboration of trade officials, diplomats, lawyers, economists, academic and industrial circle, uh, circles that together would, you know, um, make suggestions for the uh, right policies. I know that in some countries the system already exists and works quite well, but I'm not sure that this is the case for at least some other countries. So this is why, uh, for example, the WTO Secretariat could organize kind of meetings or workshop, uh, workshops on exchange of information and knowledge on such domestic procedures to find the best practices. So the following uh, four chapters deal with more specific issues such as special economic zones, the case when the governments uh, you know, implement specific industrial policy in particular zones. So um, to my knowledge, the only multilateral agreement that deals with special economic zones is the revised Kyoto Convention with this uh, you know, uh, more detailed uh, title. But when it comes to WTO itself, it does not, I mean, the agreements of this uh, organization do not mention free zones or special economic uh, zones as such, uh, but the mere fact that it is not mentioned doesn't mean that these, you know, zones are treated in a special way. Um, it simply means that the WTA in general treats these zones um, just like it treats the rest of uh, the territory. And here, uh, you know, the, the WTO, uh, law basically deals, I mean, is concerned uh, about the incentives rather than the special economic zones as such. For a time being, um, you know, special economic zones were not be uh, were not big issues in the WTO. Basically, uh, the countries took a series of countervailing duties against the products produced there because they were believed to be uh, subsidized. But uh, since recently, we even can see that at the multilateral level, you know, certain incentives they are. Uh, already challenged at the WTO's dispute settlement uh, systems level as well, such as in Brazil taxation and most recently last year in India export related measures. You know, the panelists, they found uh, certain Indian uh, incentives in its special economic zones to be prohibited. So this is, I guess, the most uh, relevant case that, you know, um, uh, found the incentives in these zones um, you know, illegal outright. So in the in chapter five, I dealt with the localization policies. That means the policy when the governments, for example, uh, require that, you know, the processing industry use certain uh, inputs, uh, raw materials from the local sources. And these policies have been always, uh, you know, popular, uh, politically attractive because they can, you know, uh, produce immediate import substitute and job creative effect um, at law or even at no uh, cost to the government. And uh, I uh, look through the WTO materials uh, in the example of the TRIMS uh, committee, uh, looked at what measures have been discussed there. And uh, with respect to the LCRs or local content requirements, we can see that there was a sharp increase uh, of these measures being discussed in this uh, system since um, the start of the global financial crisis. And here we can see um, what areas or what sectors have been, um, you know, covered by these uh, local content requirements. Interestingly, renewable sector uh, has gained more or less uh, quite, uh, you know, broad attention in um, being addressed or being covered by these uh, local content requirements. So the WTO rules are as follows, like national treatments, trade elected investment uh, measures and subsidy rules are um, uh, applicable here as well. Uh, besides these, you know, commonly known patterns of local content requirements, I also try to uh, look at the more, more recent uh, types of certain localization policies, such as um, data localization uh, measures that have been exploded these days uh, by many countries. Uh, this consists of local data storage requirements or local data center requirements and recently there have been um, you know, heated debate 
about whether these uh, data localization requirements are actually allowed or disallowed in the WTO. At least um, we can say that these types of uh, you know, requirements uh, may have negative impact on cloud services and on services that are basically reliant on um, these digital uh, services. And here we can see that the countries that are using these uh, requirements could rely or could justify their policies uh, from the privacy or cybersecurity considerations. Um, but the others could say that this is a disguised uh, industry policy of IT development and so on and so forth. So basically, um, the WTO, to my knowledge so far, the WTO dispute settlement has not been, if I'm not, that has not been dealt with this particular um, localization, um, data localization issues, though uh, digital issues have been already uh, you know, covered by many disputes. In the uh, chapter in chapter six about the green of industrial policy, right? Right. Uh, so it's basically about um, the recent movement in many industrial policies of greening them through the use of you know uh, renewable energy uh, subsidies, through the use of certain uh, carbon taxes. And here um, my focus was whether the WTO allows this kind of uh, measures, such as whether the WTO allows border carbon uh, adjustments or whether the WTO provides some policy space for renewable uh, energy subsidies. So the jurisprudence seems to provide those flexibilities. Uh, although the, uh, the subsidies rules themselves, uh, they're kind of silent on providing this policy space. So this, um, this is why many scholars uh, have uh, called for uh, providing uh, more specific rules in the subsidy, uh, subsidies agreement that would accommodate those green policies uh, in a more appropriate way. So my suggestion, for example, is to uh, to approach this issue on a country-based uh, uh, way for each uh, first to define the list of renewable energy products. And then depending on whether the country in this or that product is globally competitive or not, uh, provide this the so-called due restraint or the protection from any challenges in the WTO and uh, subject to a certain uh, predefined uh, criteria of uh, competitiveness and graduation from uh, this uh, policy space. Besides, uh, in this book, I consider the issue of environmental labels, environmental exceptions. Here you can see certain uh, WT case examples that have been uh, raised in the Article 20 on, uh, in the, uh, on general uh, exceptions. So my suggestion here is uh, uh, to uh, actually to rewrite uh, these general exceptions uh, in a one single document that would, let's say, either replicate or, I don't know, or provide a more uh, modernized version of Article 20 on general exception and Article 11, uh, 21 on security exception uh, under which, uh, and that document should be applicable across the border, across the board in the WTO without prejudice to the comparable exceptions and flexibility. The thing here is that uh, some WTO agreements are silent on whether Article 20 of the GATT is applicable or not. And uh, I suggest that with this document, or I assume that with this document, uh, the silence could be resolved, uh, could be resolved in a more explicit way. Then the last chapter is about industrial policy in the age of creative economy. Creative economy is a kind of concept or a paradigm of industrial policy of supporting economic uh, development through a merger of culture, the arts, technology, and innovation. And here is the list of uh, typical uh, you know, sectors uh, that could be considered as creative industries. Unlike many other industries, creative industries tend not to be market oriented. They tend to be uh, more oriented on the content. So the people working here are basically concerned about not whether their products such as you know, uh, publications, music or cinema would be uh, 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 sold to the market rather than they would express their creative uh, you know, ideas uh, through these culture or uh, creative uh, products. And this is why uh, some would say that they would create, uh, they would deserve uh, more protection uh, in the WTO um, uh, system. Uh, 
So here is the list of all uh, relevant cases. Um, some of them are about publications, periodicals, about the gambling industry, about copyright, intellectual property uh, issue uh, protections. Um, besides uh, these, there are certain um, issues that currently impact on um, creative uh, industries. Uh, just like any other uh, you know industries these are uh, research and development issues and digitization but when it comes to the policy space here we can see certain uh, more tailor-made uh, flexibilities given to uh, uh, creative industries uh, in the form of screen quotas then public morals and national treasure uh, protection So here is my uh, the list of my key conclusions. So first of all, industrial development is actually orchestrated by government uh, strategies and policies, and um, you know, according to the literature, any successful uh, story of industrial development uh, always uh, was enabled because of uh, certain participation of the uh, of the government. So here we can see why the government should intervene, at least in some uh, uh, areas. And the economic literature also that justifies the government's participation in the uh, in the presence of market failures. Um, but uh, the reality is that how the government should intervene, in what case the government should uh, would it uh, is always you know subject uh, to a huge debate in the uh, literature. So. Um, as I said, the WTO's, uh, WTO um, ties the hands of uh, industrial policies, uh, the hands of the government conducting their industrial policies. But uh, the thing is that without the system, you know, the, uh, the virtual unrestrained freedom of countries in relation to their industrial policies would be outweighed by much more uh, burdens and unpredictable market to their trading in the, uh, industry. So this is why which is needed. Um, so I did some suggestions with respect to decision-making process with um, what types of agreement should uh, be uh, now pursued in the WTO. So I would be uh, more, um, I would advocate uh, these days, uh, considering the realities in the WTO's uh, activities. Uh, to shift from the consensus-based uh, decision-making to voting-based, which is already allowed in the agreements. And also, um, the members should you know, show more lenience towards the plurilateral agreements. That means uh, the agreements uh, among the smaller number of members rather than the whole uh, WT membership. And it is also very uh, important that development issues uh, should be accommodated in a better way through the reforming of the SMD uh, regime. And uh, at the national level, a trilateral cooperation of the government, industries, and academia is required. Uh, and the same is true for the academic circles uh, themselves, because in many ways we can see that the academic uh, circles, they are confined only to the uh, topics of their interest, and it could be uh, great if there is kind of um, collaboration between different uh, areas of academics with respect to the same uh, area. And in my opinion, this interdisciplinary academic research could be embedded to the national or uh, national policies regarding uh, the industrial uh, development. Thank you very much. Sorry for taking so much time. Oh, no, thank you very much for this very comprehensive ov overview of your book. And next, I would like to give the floor to our discussants, Dylan, to kick off today's discussion. And I would also like to remind the audience that the Q&A will begin soon. And I invite you to send me your questions via the webinar chat box. Dylan, you have the floor. Thank you, Kerry, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, warm thank you to you and to Axel Marx of the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies for inviting me to act as a discussant in this GLOBE webinar. Um, and it has been a great pleasure to delve deeper into Sherzad's work on industrial policy in the WTO, um, especially in these times that can, uh, as I see it, at a minimum, be described as challenging for the rules-based international trading system. So I can only recommend the book to uh, to anyone who's interested in reading up on the constraints that the WTO sets 
in terms of the pursuit of industrial policy objectives by its members. Um, the book is well written, it's dense yet concise, uh, and it doesn't shy away from discussing a multitude of extremely complex issues. Um, having said that, it does so, I think, in a very accessible manner. Um, it's, 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 although there's a lot of technical details, um, it's, it's written in a manner that, that enables it to be comprehend, to be comprehensive as well as accessible to, uh, to non-WTO experts as well. And I think it's, it's to be commended and applauded for that. Um, after shows its very elaborate presentation, um, I will refrain from providing a description of the contents of, the, of, of his contribution. So instead, I would like to focus on, on two or three recent developments, uh, also depending on how much time there's available, and then tie them to the, to the relevant chapters of the book. Um, so I'd like to start actually by, by, by beginning with chapter three uh, on the promotion of domestic industry. And in the concluding remarks of chapter 3.4, um, Churchill's point out, and I quote, that the WTO sends a clear signal to its members not to subsidize in a trade distorted manner. Um, but the strict multilateral disciplines make it very difficult for governments to support local industries in a perfectly WTO consistent way, as arguably most of the government support would be caught by the SCM agreement. So in this regard, um, I'm very curious as to Scherzot's comments on the joint statement of the trilateral meeting of the trade ministers of Japan, the US and the EU uh, of the 14th of January of this year, where um, these three countries, which can be seen as, as somewhat of the um, founding members of the WTO, but, but some three key members of the organization in any event, um, where they discussed ways to strengthen existing WTO rules on industrial subsidies. Um, so the statement actually contains seven manners or seven ways to strengthen these, uh, these WTO rules. And I would like to focus on two particular aspects of the statement. So first, um, the ministers of these three countries agreed that the current list, this is a quote, of prohibited subsidies provided for in Article 3.1 of the SEM agreement, is insufficient to tackle market and trade distorting subsidization existing in certain jurisdictions. So in order to address that, they propose to um, add a number of un unconditionally prohibited subsidies to the SEM agreement, namely unlimited guarantees, subsidies to an insolvent or ailing enterprise in the ab absence of a credible restructuring plan, subsidies to enterprises unable to obtain long-term financing, or certain direct forgiveness of debt. So my first question is essentially what your views are on expanding um, the list uh, that is contained in Article 3.1. Um, is this a welcome development or do you consider this, this would um, unduly constrain the ability of WTO members to pursue industrial policy? Mm. Um, my second comment in respect of the statement is that actually the ministers of Japan, the US, and the EU agreed that the interpretation of the term public body, um, as it is used in the SEM agreement, undermines, um, or the interpretation thereof by the appellate body, um, undermines the effectiveness of WTO subsidy rules. So they state that to determine that an entity is a public body, it is not necessary to find that the entity possesses, exercises, or is vested with governmental authority. Um, now, you discussed the issue of the definition of public body on, on page 84 of the contribution. Um, and the question that I have in this respect is actually twofold. So could you provide your opinion on what to make of the fact that these ministers are so critical of the appellate body um, in this statement? And secondly, uh, whether you agree that a new definition of the term is indeed needed. Um, and finally, although, um, and understand maybe in the interest of time, um, I would I would skip this issue uh, in favor of, of one other issue that I wanted to address, and that is um, relating to chapter six and the greening of industrial policy. Uh, whereas you mentioned also during the presentation, you discuss uh, the concept of border carbon taxes, border carbon adjustments, as you refer to, the, to them. Um, and in this regard, I want to refer to the um, the European Green Deal that has been proposed by the European Commission in December, um, where they actually uh, state that in order to address carbon leakage and as long as differences in levels of ambition to address climate change continue to exist, uh, 
um, the Commission, the European Commission, will seek to introduce a carbon border adjustment mechanism. We use the term mechanism rather than a tax, although there has been mention of a tax as well. Um, and it is understood, at least here in Brussels, um, that the Commission is currently contemplating how to shape such a, such a carbon border adjustment mechanism. And I think you, you addressed it in part already. Um, but we understand that the Commission may either seek to adopt a tax on or a value added tax on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there may be a new excise duty to take care of, of, of the differences in CO2 emissions between products. Or there may be a requirement for importers to buy permits in the European Union's emissions trading scheme, the ETS. My question is essentially based on, on what you have researched, um, whether we have any recommendations for the European Union as to how to best ensure um, WTO consistency, um, and whether in this regard, and this is merely um, a, somewhat of a wild thought that I had, that there's a manner of linking this to additional commitments being made in the context of the negotiations uh, for the Paris Agreement, for example, during COP26 that is to take place in Glasgow uh, later this year. Um, and finally, uh, my last comment um, question um, relates to, it's also somewhat more of a recent comment, um, relates to the United States President's Trade Agenda and Annual Report that was presented last Friday. And this relates to the institutional characteristics um, that, you, that you discussed at the end, pluralateralism, for example. And in this regard, um, that statement notes that the United States will explore a broader reset at the WTO, and in particular that the WTO currently locks in an outdated tariff framework that no longer reflects deliberate policy choices and economic realities. Members need to fundamentally rethink tariff commitments by the United States and the trading partners. Moreover, the United States will advocate for changes that allow for more and more effective plurilateral agreements. So in light of your conclusion that members should be more lenient toward plurilateralism so as to make rulemaking in the WTO smoother and more operational, um, my question is, is this something that you can be supportive of or are you somewhat more cautious about these statements coming out uh, recently from, from the United States? Um, I would like to conclude my uh, observations. Uh, thank you very much again for the opportunity and I look forward to hearing your comments on that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dylan, for these very helpful questions. Actually, they are all really good questions, but the, the answers are difficult, actually. <laughs> because, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, when you consider them as an academic and the other thing, when you consider the you know, also political realities, then you always see that not always what the academics would, would be you know, taken by the policymakers. Uh, well, uh, addressing your questions, the first is whether um, uh, the list of prohibited subjects be extended uh, as per uh, the statement, trilateral uh, statement of the United States, EU, and Japan. Uh, actually, uh, I'm aware of this uh, initiative. Um, um, you know, uh, since uh, the main um, stakeholders in the WTO are the members themselves, so of course, uh, depending on mm, how broad their, their, their initiative would be, uh, they could change uh, the rules. Um, at least I see uh, some um, area where this prohibited uh, subsidies uh, list could be extended is the area de dealing with overcapacity issues in steel and other uh, you know, areas, just like uh, Current negotiations are, are going on on uh, fisheries overcapacity issues. The same could affect other uh, industrial sex, uh, sectors. So at least with respect to overcapacity, there could be some. I mean, this list could, uh, you know, uh, include a certain type uh, of subsidies uh, that uh, lead uh, to overcapacity. To deal with more systemic issues of um, trade distortions. With respect to the public uh, body interpretation, uh, actually, I read the applicant's um, way of interpreting uh, this issue, and also I read uh, the recent applicant body's dissent, um, one member's dissenting opinion about this, which you know largely uh, did not agree with the previous case law uh, interpretation. 
So uh, I think that to some point uh, there is the need to reconsider the concept of public body as it is interpreted. But the thing is that the public body, in my understanding, they, they interpreted the existing rules and the way that they interpreted, you know, was more or less convincing. So if they want to, uh, you know, make a strict uh, what regulation of public policy, um, then the rules, first of all, should be changed. And for that purpose, let's say the chapter on uh, state-owned enterprises in CPTPP could provide some templates where uh, they capture certain, uh, what is it called, non-financial or non-commercial assistance provided by the state-owned enterprises. So they do not require state-owned enterprises to be public bodies. And also they capture state-owned assistance given to state-owned enterprises, uh, given specifically state-owned enterprises. So they create kind of new specificity requirement uh, for subsidies. So if subsidies are provided to state-owned enterprises, they are considered specific. So, um, so if the public body's concept should be considered, then the best way for doing so would be through changing the rules or providing more clarification. Then, um, with respect to border carbon uh, adjustment, uh, the current EU's uh, policy of uh, creating a certain taxes or ETS at the border. Um, so here, um, I, I would say you know, that, in my opinion, uh, the I mean, the safest way of providing this border carbon adjustment would be through the use of uh, carbon taxes rather than the ETS, because in my, I, I, I you know, reviewed the literature and the existing case law, and I found that uh, there is more or less uh, more policy space for uh, adjusting carbon taxes rather than the, uh, you know, was it uh, emission allowances, and the rules. As long as they are, um, you know, as they are now, then uh, then I would say that uh, adjusting carbon taxes would be uh, on a more uh, safer footing than adjusting uh, the ETS across the border. And the recent and the last question regarding the uh, U.S. report uh, about the WTO system as a whole and the everybody in particular. Um, I think we still have to see uh, what concrete. Uh, way or concrete proposals the US government or administration would make in order to address those tariff commitments and plurilateral uh, initiative. So uh, my idea about plurilateral initiative is um, in creating new rules among uh, in a limited numbers if they agree so. Uh, I don't know what exactly the US would have in their mind in getting more you know plurilateral uh, Agreement. So if this is the plurilateral in outside of the WTO, then this is, I would say, for the multilateral system. So my proposition is to accommodate more plurilateral agreements within the WTO rather than outside, uh, so as not to put uh, the system uh, at high risk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now uh, we have a bit of time left, so I will start with a round of questions from the audience. We'll start first with a question from Laura Mazai. Um, do you forecast any change in the WTO rules when the European Union will, will uh, create a new definition of the concept of sustainability, environment, social, and economic sustainability, and include it in the EU law and secondary legislation? Another question from Axel Marx. Um, he, he says, you already touched upon the greening of industrial production and industrial policies. Uh, the way in which industrial po products are made can be more or less environmentally friendly. Is there any scope within the WTO to distinguish between environmentally friendly produced goods and goods which are produced in an environmentally detrimental way? For example, can different tariffs be applied to similar goods which are produced differently from an environmental perspective? Um, between food which is produced sustainably, for instance, or uh, not produced sustainably? And third, a third question would be from um, Levin Schmidt, and he is wondering whether uh, you think that we will still have a fully fledged and operational WTO in 2030. Um, and as a second question from him, if voting is applied for decision making WTO, 
how should those votes be weighted? So we'll start with those and see if we have time for more. Again, very interesting, but the same very difficult questions. Uh, so regarding the EU sustainability, um, was it analysis or criteria? Uh, whether uh, they could be brought into the WTO system. Uh, actually, um, I would first encourage countries to uh, join EU in creating those sustainability uh, criteria or sustainability assessment first in their domestic legislation before bringing it to the WTO. Because in my understanding, if I uh, get that question correctly, then uh, the sustainability impact assessment by the EU deals with, uh, with how those uh, issues would impact on the domestic uh, environment rather than uh, the WTO. So regarding uh, the second uh, question of uh, environmental goods, if I get, if I remember it correctly, it is whether environmental goods deserve uh, similar or different uh, tariff rates with respect to competitive is it, is, was yeah, it that? I, that was the example, but he um, he's asking whether there's a scope within the WTO to distinguish between environmentally friendly produced goods and those that are not produced in an environmentally friendly manner. Oh, uh, oh, oh, I see. Uh, so I guess this deals with uh, the so-called PPMS, uh, product uh, processing methods. Uh, so generally, um, I mean, it's really uh, case by case. So for example, uh, in the national treatment provisions of Article 3 uh, of the GATT so far, uh, you know, the way of how goods were produced uh, without you know, leaving any traces. And here we, do, uh, we uh, can uh, talk about the environmentally friendly produced goods. Uh, I mean, if they are treated differently, then uh, they could be said to be uh, discriminatory uh, under national treatment provisions, but at the same time, uh, the case law provides more uh, flexibility under Article 20. So if they are uh, captured as discriminatory under Article 3, then they could be justified under Article uh, 20. I mean, so far, uh, so far uh, uh, this was uh, a trend. But uh, once again, it depends on what we're talking about. Under certain uh, agreements, if I'm not mistaken, under TBT still there is a way of accommodating uh, environmentally friend, uh, friend, uh accommodating products produced in an environmentally friendly uh, way. Then uh, the next question, whether the WTO can sustain by 2030, was that question, sorry? Uh, what, am I right? Whether the question, w yeah, it, whether there will still be a fully fledged and operational WTO in 2030, <laughs> if you're gonna forecast the future. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I cannot forecast, <laughs> I can just... <laughs> assess uh, based um, on the facts. So actually, I, I do hope, uh, just like as many other uh, people do hope, that the WTO can sustain uh, by that time and even beyond that time. But for that, of course, the WTO needs uh, refor uh, reforming. Without the reforming, uh, without you know uh, creating new rules or modernizing the rules to be more um, uh, suitable to the current realities, the WTO is at risk, at least at risk, of uh, being outcompeted by perhaps other institutions that would substitute WTO in many aspects, if not uh, all. So, and I guess the current crisis uh, and should be considered as kind of window of opportunity for modernizing the WTO. So, I would say that the WTO would sustain full, as a full-fledged full organization by 2030 if. Uh, it will be if it is uh, reformed. In what way? This is you know, something that the member should uh, decide. But uh, in, in its current version, um, I don't think that it will, uh, you know, it will be as successful in 30 as it was before. Then, regarding the decision-making process, um, as I already mentioned, WTO agreement, in my understanding, uh, already provides, uh, you know, voting. Uh, the option of voting as a second best uh, option uh, after consensus. So um, if this is already allowed by the agreements then the members themselves should kind of, uh, you know, try to um, switch from consensus-based uh, rulemaking to uh, voting-based rulemaking. Uh, 
And one of the approaches would be whenever they deal with certain issues or initiatives that require decision making, they could already at that time decide, uh, put certain timing, uh, um, you know, limits uh, within which they could, you know, try to build uh, consensus. And if within that uh, time uh, time limits the consensus is not reached, then they could automatically switch uh, to the uh, voting option. So th that could be one of the way of you know, making voting uh, more operational under the current system. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, I We are at now five o'clock, so I don't think we have time for another round of questions. Um, but I would like to thank both of our speakers, um, Shirzad and Dylan, and as well as all of the audience members for taking part in this webinar today. And before leaving you, I would like to announce um, some upcoming GLOBE webinars. We have another one coming up on March 16th with Lisbeth Huga and her recent book, A Theory of International Organization. And then in April, uh, Stefano Ponte will join us to discuss his new book, uh, Business, Power, and Sustainability in a World of Global Value Chains. And in May, we'll hear from Charles Roger on his new book, The Origins of Informality, Why the Legal Foundations of Global Governance are Shifting and Why it Matters. So again, I would like to thank you uh, very much for uh, joining us today, Shirzad and Dylan. And um, we will look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.